A grizzled old adventurer sits in the tavern, recanting tales of the ancient dragons, demon lords, and even the mighty Tarrasque that they have battled over the years. But what scares them the most are the monsters they faced as a brand new adventurer. We are talking about the five deadliest low-level monsters in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the, the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. And today we're taking a look at five of the deadliest low-level monsters in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Dungeons & Dragons is packed with deadly creatures which can annihilate even the most powerful adventurers. Demon lords, mighty dragons, insane elementals, and aberrations from beyond the far realm can decimate player characters and send the others running for their lives. And although these are wonderful set-piece battles, we're not focusing on those today. We're going to go all the way back down to the very low-level monsters of challenge rating 2 or under. These are monsters that because of their low challenge rating and the bounded accuracy system in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, they're able to pose as much of a threat to a first-level character as they can to a very high-level character, even as far as 20th level. Because of this, these monsters can also be used in very large groups, where their unique abilities can be leveraged to deadly effect. These monsters possess abilities that can bypass the defenses of the highest level players, or the intelligence to get around them. These abilities are often so powerful that they can kill a player character outright which makes them very unique and part of a very small subset of creatures that have the ability to bypass the damage dealing capabilities of other monsters and go right for the kill. So, let's get rolling. The first monster we're going to look at today is the Shadow. The Shadow is a challenge rating one half undead creature. Formed of shadow stuff itself, it lurks in the darkest depths of the dungeons, striking out from within the shadows cast of adventurers themselves. As it, its amorphous form allows it to move almost silently and sneak into very small spaces as it tails behind a party of adventurers waiting for the moment to strike. The shadow is immune to a whole slew of different conditions and resistant to weapon damage and various types of elemental damage as well, although it is vulnerable to uh, radiant damage. And it only has a handful of hit points, but these resistances do make it quite tough, especially at low levels. That said, the Shadow's most iconic and deadly ability is its Strength Drain melee attack. This attack only deals 9 points of necrotic damage, which doesn't seem like that much on paper. But when you get hit by the Strength Drain ability, your Strength score is reduced by 1d4. And if you are hit successive times by this ability, such that your Strength is reduced to 0, you die outright. There is no saving throw to avoid the Strength damage. If the attack hits, it happens. And as the damage is racking up against your Strength score, fighters and paladins and barbarians are losing their ability to attack effectively because they say, suffer penalties to their attack and damage. Characters wearing heavy armor might find that their armor is now weighing them down dramatically so they can't move as effectively. So it really causes a bit of a death spiral until eventually your strength is drained completely and you die only to be raised up 1d4 hours later as a shadow yourself. That's the real kicker. Your friend goes down in battle and a few hours later you're fighting their shadow. So it's, it's brutal. If you're somebody who stands in the back lines and usually doesn't have a very high strength score to begin with, like a spellcaster, chances are you're not going to last a lot of rounds if you're getting pummeled by shadows. Worse still, since these characters like archers, rogues, wizards are often in the back ranks of the party, where a shadow's stealth abilities make it very, very easy for them to sneak up behind the party, it's relatively easy for a shadow or a pair of shadows to ambush a vulnerable and weak player character, drain their strength down to zero, and kill them really, really quickly. The shadow's low challenge rating means that even a second or third level party might have to face two, three, maybe even four shadows at a time. And the shadow's 
abilities naturally gravitate them towards kind of all enveloping a single target at once, and a wizard with eight strength that gets hit by a, a strength drain attack for 1d4, it only takes three, maybe four hits for their strength score to be drained out completely, and they're dead outright. With a lot of these player characters that do have lower strength scores, that also means that as they level up throughout a campaign, they may not gain better armor or gain better AC, meaning that the shadows can still do a lot of damage to them at very high level play as well. And even a mighty character with a very high strength score of 18 or 20 can really only take a few blows from a shadow before they go down. It won't matter that your Barbarian has 200 hit points and resistance to all damage when it only takes maybe 6 to 8 hits from a Shadow to drain their strength down to zero. So how do you fight against Shadows? Well, having a Paladin in your, in your party really helps. Somebody who can dish out some Radiant damage. Or if you have any spells or any way to create Sunlight, that can help out as well. And of course, it's a great reason to bring a restoration spell along with you as these things can be used in the middle of combat if you do need to remove that strength damage you do also recover from the strength damage after only a short rest but it does mean that until you can get a rest and recuperate in some way the shadow leaves a lasting scar even after it's been defeated Next up on our list of deadly low-level monsters is the Swarm. Specifically, we're looking at the Swarm of Rot Grubs Ooh. from Volo's Guide to Monsters, but Swarms in general are an often overlooked and pretty deadly type of monster in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, and there's a few reasons for this. Swarms are often resistant to piercing, slashing, and in some cases bludgeoning damage as well, and there's not really any way to get around this. Magic weapons don't help like they do for the resistance possessed by most other creatures like demons and outsiders. And interestingly enough, swarms in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons aren't vulnerable to area of effect damage. While they take damage normally from elemental effects such as a fireball or a burning hands, they're not actually susceptible to these things like they were in prior editions where they took double damage from area effect effects. So it means that your party does have to chew through all their hit points, and while swarms usually have a low AC, they often have more hit points than as normal for their challenge ratings. Yeah, swarms don't hit very hard, but they can hit a lot, and they're very hard to kill, which can make them a big challenge. Now, when we're looking specifically at the Rot Grubs, these guys have some extra abilities that are super deadly. The Swarm of Rot Grubs only has a plus zero to hit. Yeah. Meaning that it's not going to hit very often, but it's only a challenge rating one half creature, so it's very easy to encounter several Swarms of Rot Grubs. When the Swarm of Rot Grubs does manage to land a hit, the target is infected by 1d4 small Rot Grubs, which burrow into the target's skin and start eating their way towards its heart. For every Rot Grub that then infests the target, they take 1d6 points of piercing damage at the start of each of their turns. So if you are starting to get infested with Rot Grubs, you have a few options here. On the first turn that you have Rot Grubs burrowing into your skin, you can apply fire to it, doing at least one fire damage to yourself and killing those Rot Grubs that are burrowing inside of you. However, after one round, these Rot Grubs will burrow too far into your skin for the fire damage to do anything. It might be possible to do some sort of invasive surgery at this point, but the best way to get rid of them is to use some sort of magical effect which cures disease, like a Paladin's Lay on Hands or the Lesser Restoration spell. Because if the Rot Grubs are in a creature's system when that creature ends its turn with zero hit points, the Rot Grubs burrow into their heart and kill them outright. So... A, player, a group of player characters that doesn't have a paladin or someone capable of casting Lesser Restoration that finds themselves infested with even one Rot Grub, this can be a death sentence for that character. What's interesting to me is, as a DM, if you're reading the stat block, you understand all of this. If you're a player and you've never encountered Rot Grubs before, how are you going to know any of this? All that the DM says is that there's worms burrowing into your skin. 
How are you supposed to know to apply fire or that you need to get them out before you die? Hopefully you've got a knowledgeable wizard or ranger that is aware of these types of dungeon hazards. And that's another thing that can be a little bit deceiving about a swarm of creatures as well, is that oftentimes swarms are formed of creatures that we would kind of shrug off to see in a dungeon anyways. There's always going to be rats or bats or bugs or insects or snakes. But then there's a lot more than you thought there were going to be. And almost all of the swarms, including the bats and the snakes, deal a surprising amount of damage for their challenge rating and are pretty difficult to kill. So much like the shadow, swarms can be one of these creatures that player characters often underestimate. And all of a sudden they're coming out from the woodwork, swarming over the player characters, and they don't have the resources to survive against the creatures. So how do you deal with swarms? Kill it with fire. Seriously, like as quickly as possible. This is the thing that Burning Hands is there for. Like, get out the flamethrower and destroy them as quickly as you can. Yeah, they can be messy if they get all up in your space here. This is the time for the uh, the spellcasters and various things like that to really shine at getting rid of these swarms as fast as possible. The tricky thing, though, is, is that oftentimes the swarm gets into the space of the person, like gets inside another creature's space. And so once it's there, now you can't deal the area of effect damage effectively to the swarm without hurting your allies in the process. Sometimes that's worth it, too. If, if your ally is covered in rats... Maybe they don't mind being burning hands just to get rid of them all. <laughs> From the depths of the Underdark, we have the insane creation of the Mind Flayers, and that is the Intellect Devourer. This challenge rating to Aberration is rightly feared as one of the deadliest creatures in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, period, and a major contributor to the terrifying reputation of its Mind Flayer overlords. The Intellect Devourer does something that not a lot of creatures in Dungeons & Dragons do, and that's that it attacks your intelligence. And in D&D 5e, if you're not playing a wizard, it's very likely that you have a low intelligence score. Many player characters in Dungeons & Dragons rarely have an intelligence score higher than 12. I find it's very common to see a lot of player characters, particularly fighters and barbarians, with intelligence scores of 8 or lower. And this makes them prime prey for the Intellect Devourer's iconic abilities Devour Intellect and Body Thief, both of which play on the intelligence score of the Intellect Devourer's victim. So let's start with discussing Devour Intellect. This is the Intellect Devourer's most basic ability. It targets one creature within uh, 10 feet of it, so it's a pretty short range. Uh, that creature has to make only a DC 12 intelligence saving throw, or they take some psychic damage. That DC 12 intelligence saving throw is really hard to make for a lot of PCs. They usually fail it more than half the time because they have no bonuses to it, and in many cases they have a penalty. All of my player characters somehow end up with an 8 intelligence, and that just means that I have a minus 1 on my dice rolls there. And rolling over a 12 can actually be challenging, especially if you have a whole bunch of intellect devourers coming at you. This can be difficult, and it also stuns you. Yes. Once you've taken psychic damage from the attack, the intellect of our rolls 3d6, and if it beats your intelligence score, you become stunned until the end of your next turn. This is one of the lowest level creatures with a very difficult to resist stun attack, because again, rolling over an 8 or a 10 is something that's very easy to do on 3d6 for an intellect of our. In fact, from what I can tell, for most adventurers that are facing an Intellect Devourer that have an int of 10 and no other bonuses, they generally have about a 34% chance of getting stunned outright by an Intellect Devourer, which is pretty high. If you follow this up with Body Thief, things get even worse for the player characters. An Intellect Devourer within 5 feet of a creature can target it with Body Thief, teleporting into the creature's brain if it wins an intelligence contest. Again, the Intellect of Hour has an intelligence of 12, so it's often going to be up against the common adventurer. If the Intellect of Hour wins this contest, it teleports inside the target's skull, destroying its brain and taking over the creature's body. This is brutal because not only are you now down a player, but the Intellect of Hours are up a new fighter or some other class. 
Uh, but they basically gain the ability to use that player character as a puppet, and now you have to fight your former friend. A friend who is dead outright and has had their brain devoured. Intellect devours as only challenge rating two creatures, and the insane creations of Mind Flayers are very easy to use in groups, and with their intelligence score, Intellect devours are smart enough to pick out targets that are vulnerable to their abilities and gang up using Devour Intellect in succession against a single target until one Intellect Devourer gets the opportunity to jump inside that target's skull. Even worse, if those Intellect Devourers are backing up a Mind Flayer who's already stunned a bunch of targets with its Mind Blast ability, then they just go to town and start teleporting inside the entire party's brains. That's a recipe for a total party kill right there. So, when you're confronted with a swarm of intellect devourers... Just run. Yeah. Just, just run. These this, abilities are really short-ranged. This is not the time to send in your barbarian first. Your barbarian will turn against you and become a puppet for the Mind Flayer. Yeah. The one saving grace of these abilities is that their range is very, very short, and the intellect devourer only has 21 hit points. And a relatively low AC, meaning that it is pretty easy to kill them, and you better kill them fast. Because I, I have seen few monsters that have such a high chance to take out a player character outright. Um, P PCs in 5th edition are just so vulnerable to intelligence-based attacks, because the classes don't generally encourage you to have a high intelligence unless you're trying to roleplay a smart character. Well, if you're choosing the career of an adventurer, you're probably not the most intelligent person anyway. In one campaign we were playing in, I was playing a half-orc paladin who was killed by an intellect devourer and then turned against the party. Monty let me continue to roleplay the character, but I had to play it against the party. So, of course, I blew all of my Divine Smites and took out two other party members. <laughs> it was such a mess. It was a mess. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Intellect of Hours, for totally ruining our entire party. I think that that's kind of the unspoken terror of the Intellect of Hour, is it's not so much that it's killed your paladin, it's that it's killed your paladin and now taken over your paladin and is turning those player characters' abilities against the rest of the party. It really creates a losing situation if even one intellect devourer is able to get the body thief ability off. A lesson for all you adventurers out there, dungeons are usually pretty filthy. If you come across a clean one, you might want to get a little suspicious. You might be encountering the gelatinous cube. The gelatinous cube is an iconic Dungeons and Dragons monster. A giant quivering cube of translucent acidic jello that lumbers through the halls of a dungeon like a living Roomba, sucking up everything in its path, whether it's dust particles, small rats and bugs, or entire adventurers, devouring them and dissolving them into nothingness. When the gelatinous cube is standing still, it's almost impossible to detect. As a matter of fact, every gelatinous cube that I've encountered, I have failed to detect and have walked right into. That might just be my bad playing, but they surprise me every single time. The gelatinous cube, despite its lumbering nature, as Kelly said, is a great ambusher. And what an ambush it causes. Once you're engulfed by a gelatinous cube, it's... 6d6 acid damage at the start of every turn you're inside that cube, and its pseudopods hit pretty hard too. While this isn't a lot of damage, it is only a challenge rating 2 creature, and for adventurers with low strength and dexterity scores, it can be really difficult to break your way out of a gelatinous cube. Especially if there's more than one of them, or if you're trapped down a hallway with nowhere to go. A very canny dungeon builder can build systems in their dungeons which turn the gelatinous cube really into a living trap. That is honestly the best use of the gelatinous cube is when you're in that thin, narrow hallway and you're up against a locked door or a dead end and there's a gelatinous cube coming at you. There's almost nothing more terrifying. And with the amount of damage it does, 
it can wreck a party member pretty quickly if you didn't expect it. Or more than one, because the gelatinous cube can run over multiple creatures, and I've even seen an entire party of adventurers trapped inside the cube being slowly dissolved together. The gelatinous cube might seem pretty slow. It only has a speed of 15 feet, but in 5th edition, when it does use its engulf ability, it gets to move again. So it can travel forward at a pretty fair clip towards adventurers. The gelatinous cube isn't very stealthy, but it is hard to see. So oftentimes I like to park my gelatinous cubes down alcoves or hidden around a, a 90 degree turn in a hallway. So as the party comes around the turn, they kind of just walk right into the gelatinous cube. Or for some extra fun, I like to have my gelatinous cubes living at the bottom of a pit trap or drop down from the ceiling as kind of a a jelly block on top of an adventurer's head. There's so many creative ways as a dungeon master to use gelatinous cubes as part of a trap, and I'm always looking for fun and creative ways to unexpectedly cube my party. And it doesn't matter what level your party's at, if you fall into a pit trap and wind up stuck in a gelatinous cube, you're having a bad day. Yeah, it's relatively easy to escape from a gelatinous cube if you have a good strength score but just as we talked about with the shadow strength and intelligence tend to be these very polarizing ability scores in fifth edition DD. so oftentimes player characters either are really really good at breaking out of things or really really bad at it and that makes the gelatinous cube pretty deadly against those creatures that again are often in the back line and get sucked up unexpectedly by the gelatinous cube to round out our list of the deadliest low-level monsters in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, we are bestowing our highest honors and grandest praise upon perhaps one of the lowliest creatures in the Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition game. And that's the Cobalt. Cobalds have a reputation as feeble cannon fodder, but this doesn't need to be so. For in all the games that I have run, it has often been the simplest most innocuous creatures that have been the most terrifying. And we want to talk for a moment, if you haven't heard of it already, of a famous story that was printed in Dragon Magazine many, many years ago, back in Dragon 127. And that is a story by Roger E. Moore called Tucker's Cobalts. Now, what's beautiful about this story is that you can relate it to really any low-level creature that has some form of intelligence or an ability to work amongst themselves to trap the player characters. But in this story of Tucker's Kobolds, we take a look at how Kobolds can be one of the most deadly encounters for even a high level party because they love using traps and different sort of uh, gadgets and gear to really make things much more dangerous than you would anticipate when you see them. The famous story of Tucker's Kobolds tells the tale of a dungeon master by the name of Tucker who had an exceptionally deadly dungeon. But for all the horrors that were packed into this dungeon, demons, fiery undead creatures, unspeakable threats in the depths of the dungeon, nothing scared Tucker's players more than the kobolds that dwelt in level one of the dungeon. Tucker's players would go to inordinate depths to avoid going through the Cobalt Warrens, for this area of the dungeon had been riddled with traps, honeycombed with secret passages and murder holes, and the inventive Cobalts had found all sorts of ways to use weapons, metal armor, split move and fire tactics, and other dastardly innovations to slay and destroy adventurers who embarked in their domain. To this day, Tucker's Kobolds is a textbook example of how to take an innocuous, low-level enemy and turn them into a deadly threat with smart tactics, intelligence, and some good use of equipment and the environment. The lesson here is less about looking at the stat block of the creature. If you look at the stat block of the Kobolds, other than their pack tactics ability, they don't have really anything that's going to stand out. But kobolds love working together, and they love using traps to foil their enemies, and they're smart about it. So when the player characters walk into a room, and the kobolds bar the door and set the entire room on fire, 
suddenly that is probably the most dangerous encounter, and then all of a sudden they're poking out of holes in the ceiling to fire their slings at the players while they're in a room on fire. This no longer is a battle against some simple kobolds. This is a deadly encounter. Not bad for a bunch of challenge rating 1 8th weaklings with less than 5 hit points each. Of course, over the years, kobolds have evolved a little bit more, and we now have creatures like the Erd or the Winged Kobold, Kobold Sorcerers, Kobold Inventors, and all sorts of variants on the basic Monster Manual Kobold. But nevertheless, it doesn't take a lot of changes to the statistics of a kobold to make them into an interesting and memorable enemy. Uh, I myself have been drawn inspiration from the tales of Tuckard's kobolds and had dragons use kobolds as their outward defense network for their lair, combining the low-level kobolds and their dastardly tactics with the deadliness of a dragon's lair to wonderful effect, creating some truly memorable encounters for my players. And you can apply these ideas to any other sort of mundane monster, like orcs, or bandits, or cultists, or gnolls. Finding out what that creature's intelligent niche is, and how you can turn it up to 11, is a great creative way to create an unexpected and deadly challenge for your player characters. So we've taken a look at some really deadly monsters, and we've talked about how to use them in the most deadly way. As a DM, you may want to be careful throwing these at very low level or new players because they may not be ready for this sort of danger to be presented to them and you could wipe out an entire party just by using some of these monsters. So be cautious when using them, but also keep in mind how powerful low level monsters can be. We want to use deadly low-level monsters to pose an interesting challenge to the players and get them to think about their strategies and tactics in different ways. And oftentimes using deadly monsters like this is best done in a way that telegraphs their presence. Having a colony of mind flayers and intellect devourers suddenly spring out of nowhere on your player characters is actually pretty unfair and probably not going to be a lot of fun for them. But finding ways to foreshadow this threat, to build into it in an interesting and creative way, is going to A, make your player characters way more scared and terrified because a little foreshadowing goes a long way, and also add a little bit more fairness into the scenario because the player characters can start thinking about how they're going to survive a little bit in advance rather than suddenly being ambushed by a billion shadows that drain their strength down to zero and they die with no chance. That's just not a fun scenario and don't do that especially to new players because it's really easy to wipe a party out. It, there's no skill involved in that. There's no skill really in making a deadly combat encounter that wipes out your player characters. What makes a deadly encounter fun and memorable is placing it in an interesting way that provokes creative thought and good survival strategies from your player characters rather than just a slaughterhouse. When you foreshadow these deadly monsters, it then becomes fun even if the player characters don't notice the foreshadowing. For example, they're in a dungeon and the dungeon master is describing how all the floors are spotless and clean and they just go wandering right into a gelatinous cube. They're going to look back at that and say, oh man, all the clues were there and I was just too blind to see it. This still means that when they run into the deadly encounter, they realize that it had been foreshadowed rather than just being dropped on them unexpectedly. And that's really what makes these stand out, is having an environment, having a place and setting that when the player characters start to examine it and look at what's around them, they realize that they might be in for something that's a little more dangerous and a little more deadly than they had previously anticipated. And this can make for a really exciting combat encounter. So this has been a look at five of the deadliest low-level monsters in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you see them, run. And we would love to hear about your favorite low-level deadly threats or stories of using these monsters in your campaigns in the comments below. If you want to see us dealing with some of these deadly monsters, check out our live play Dungeons of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. on twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes and is loaded onto our YouTube every Friday. 
If you enjoy the show and want to help support the channel, you can check us out on Patreon. You can follow the links below to learn how you can help us out, or check out patreon.com slash dungeon underscore dudes. All of these monsters benefit from a cool environment. And if you want to learn more about building epic environments for your combat encounters, we have a video on that right up over here. And if you want to learn how monster stats work in Dungeons & Dragons 5e, check out our video right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.